Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Please welcome to the stage Eric Alm. Hi, thanks. It's a, really an honor to be here today and to share some of our work with you. Um, what I want to talk to you today is uh, some work that we've done uh, on the human microbiome. And we're all familiar with uh, bacteria as vehicles for uh, infectious disease. But what we're starting to learn is that uh, the bacteria and the microorganisms that live in and on our bodies uh, are really uh, required. They're required for human life, and they contribute directly to uh, not only disease, but also to health. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about some work that uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, take part in um, that really spawned from a remarkable gift from a former alumnus uh, and corporation member, uh, Neil Rasmussen. So Neil Rasmussen um, uh, gave a remarkable gift to, to MIT that allowed us to start the Center for Microbiome Informatics and Therapeutics. Uh, and, and this has really led to not only cross-departmental uh, collaborations, um, but it's really made MIT a hub for a lot of the medical research that's going on in the Boston area in the particular field of microbiome. So one of the questions I usually ask folks is, what was it? Why, why you know, if you've seen microbiome in the, in the news, uh, you see there's, there's a lot of excitement around it. Um, and it's all very recent. So what was it that sparked the, uh, the emerging interest in the microbiome? What was the, the technology that allowed us to probe the microbiome? Was it a, a new method of uh, growing these bacteria in, in the laboratory so we could study them? Uh, perhaps a new microscope? Any guesses? It was DNA sequencing. So we had an idea a few decades back that if only we knew all of the possible drug targets in the body, if all, well, we didn't know how many genes there were. Some people thought there were 100,000, some people thought there were 5,000, turns out there's about 25,000. But if only we had the DNA blueprint for all of those genes, we would have all the drug targets and that would really spur uh, drug development, okay? Uh, and what you see here is uh, we put a lot of effort into that and we got very, 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 very good at sequencing DNA really fast and, and really cheap. And this is logarithmic plot, and, and so you see it's, it's uh, the, the cost of sequencing DNA is going down faster. It's super exponential, okay? It's growing faster than Moore's law. But this is the, the number of drugs that we're getting per billion dollars of uh, R&D spent in, in pharma. And so we haven't yet seen the gains. And one of the reasons why we haven't seen the gains is because there's a lag time. And a lot of the folks in biological engineering are working on systems biology. And that's helping us understand, now that we have all the parts, how do they work together? How do they form circuits like we've heard about earlier today? And how do those circuits ultimately impact human health? And so I think this curve is going to reverse, but there's a lag time. We need to fully understand the system before we can take advantage of the fact that we know what all the genes are. However, with the microbiome, I think the story is different. And this is basically our idea. This is our idea that uh, Neil Rasmussen um, has, has funded us to pursue here. And uh, the idea is quite simple. We know these bacteria are a fundamental part of the human body. So we're using the fact that we can sequence DNA very cheaply and, and, and very quickly to take lots and lots of people, figure out what bacteria are in their bodies by sequencing the DNA and getting a molecular barcode. So we have a list for each person that we look at, what are the names of all the bacteria that, uh, that are in them. And then we can compare the healthy people and the sick people. And if the sick people are missing one key bacteria that's in all the healthy people, now we have an idea. We don't, we don't need a complicated model to figure out what that drug looks like. We just need to find that bacteria, we put it in a pill, we feed it to patients, that's a clinical trial, okay? So we've gone from DNA sequencing directly to a hypothesis that we can test in the clinic. And the best part is these drugs probably have low toxicity in humans because they are a natural part of the human body, they're a natural part of our personal ecosystem. So 
Part A is DNA sequencing. The other half of this diagram is, is culture. We're isolating all these bacteria in the laboratory. We're putting them in our freezer. We have over 6,000 now from 11 different people. Um, and we're continuing to grow that. We're actually traveling around the world to get bacteria from uh, indigenous peoples and isolated human populations. So we really have the complete set of bacteria that grow in human beings. There's a lot of diseases that have been correlated with, uh, with microbiome. This is a very, very incomplete list, and it's almost every week we see new diseases that are significantly associated with the microbiome. So, so there's lots of diseases that we can go after where there's a difference between the bacteria in healthy people and the bacteria in sick people. There's a lot of correlations. Uh, as we know, correlation does not always mean causation, okay? Um, but as long as we have a correlation, we can think about diagnostics, and we can think about diseases for which uh, diagnosis is, is difficult, and this is something that we've done a lot. So um, here's one example. Um, this is a hypothetical example of Ashley Davis. Uh, she's an undergraduate here, um, and you know she's, she's feeling sick, she's feeling nauseous, her grades are, are going down, and she wants a treatment plan immediately. So uh, you know she comes into the clinic, she has some risk factors that uh, point toward inflammatory disease, some risk factors that point toward non-inflammatory disease, uh, and really the best thing to do is a colonoscopy. But let's say she, you know, her father had a, a bad history with colonoscopy, um, and she's afraid to do it, but she still wants a treatment. And what we really want um, is we really want non-invasive uh, diagnostics for, for inflammatory disease. So this is a very typical case. Um, and what we've been doing is trying to harness the power of the microbiome and DNA sequencing to build these diagnostics. And when we build these diagnostics, um, it's big data. It's not the type of uh, data that a doctor usually orders in a lab report, which you see on the, on the left is the sort of the, the typical data that might come in. Microbiome data is going to be too complex for any one clinician to sit there on the fly and, and analyze. So uh, we also need to start thinking about algorithms and part of the diagnosis process, even part of the therapeutic process, is going to involve algorithms. And this is all new territory. It's new territory for FDA to figure out how, you know, how are we going to regulate algorithms when algorithms are part of healthcare? How are we going to change medical records so that uh, doctors can see the, the predictions of, of theoretical models and things like that? So we're starting to do this today. So um, this is uh, one of the studies that I first got involved in. This is uh, done with Athos Busvaros at Children's Hospital. Uh, he came to me, he said, Eric, we've got a problem. Um, we have a lot of pediatric patients who come in with inflammatory disease, and we can't send every eight-year-old kid who has stomach pains out for a colonoscopy. We need a non-invasive test that is sensitive, um, and uh, if, you know, if that test comes up positive, then, then we'll send them out for colonoscopy. So we collected stool samples from uh, sick kids who did not have inflammatory disease, we collected stool samples from sick kids who had ulcerative colitis and then sick kids who had Crohn's disease. And when you look at these data, so on the rows, those are all the different bacteria, and the darker colors means there's more in that particular patient, and, and the columns are the patients, okay? Um, nothing really stands out. But when we use machine learning algorithms to train on all of these very weak predictors, we were able to uh, predict very accurately, as accurate as the current gold standard non-invasive test, uh, whether or not the kids had inflammatory disease. And the best part is, we looked at how good our predictions got as a function of how many kids we diagnosed, and the model keeps getting better. So the more we use it, the better the test gets. And that's not true for a standard ELISA test or, or a standard laboratory test. One of the things I'm particularly passionate about is that patients need access to this data that we're generating on them. And so one of the studies that, uh, that we're starting up now is taking inflammatory bowel disease patients, taking lots and lots of uh, samples uh, non-invasively from them over time, and trying to build predictors so we can tell not only when a patient is sick, but when a patient is starting to get sick, so we can start to intervene before they get sick and do preventative care. 
um, we're starting to we're starting to do this today. And so I'll tell you about a, a study that we performed um, in 2009. And this was a study where we decided to track 300 uh, different lifestyle factors, get patients to record every single morsel of food that they ate, and it, every time they woke up in the middle of the night, if they traveled, if they got sick, 300 different um, um, factors uh, for a year. Okay, and then we needed to collect a stool sample every day. Nobody signed up for the study. <laughs> so my graduate student Lawrence David and I took it upon ourselves to sign ourselves up for the study for, for science. Um, <clears throat> and on the top, uh, you see my microbiome in 2009. On the bottom is Lawrence's microbiome in, in, in 2009. Okay, and uh, if we zoom in a little bit closer to my microbiome, um, you can see something remarkable happen about three quarters of the way in. Okay, I went out to a local um, uh, restaurant and I got the chef's special French toast. Uh, it came complete with a salmonella infection, so I got food poisoning. I went to the, the urgent care at the time, and I, you know, I said, uh, I, I think I've got uh, food poisoning. He said, nonsense, it's a virus. So I didn't get antibiotics. Uh, I got an IV, and I, I, I was sent home. Um, but now I've got the DNA evidence, which I wish I had had at the time, <laughs> that it was food poisoning, it was, it was salmonella. Now, the remarkable thing I want you to notice about this slide is um, the different rows are different bacteria. The x-axis, of course, is, is time. And the warmer colors means there's more of that bacteria on that particular day. The, the blue colors indicate there's less on, on that particular day. And so after I got salmonella, all of those bacteria in the top right disappeared. They went extinct from, from my gut. And they were replaced with that block of red bacteria, and that means we can think about engineering the microbiome. We can reprogram it. Hopefully not by giving people food poisoning, but it says it, it, it can be changed. Um, we're thinking about other things too, not just uh, sequencing the, the DNA, um, but we're starting trials with wearable devices and profiling the immune system, like uh, uh, Daryl just talked about, and integrating all of these data to get a, a more complete uh, picture of patient health. So if we think about engineering the immune system, um, one of the key things that, that comes to mind in terms of microbiome is fecal transplants. And uh, if folks saw the booth outside uh, uh, by Open Biome, uh, then you've heard all about fecal transplants, or maybe you've heard about them on the news. But what we have is a case where uh, often patients will come to the doctor's office, they'll get antibiotics for uh, a condition that has nothing to do with Clostridium difficile infection. In the hospital, they will acquire, uh, the most common gut infection for uh, patients to acquire is uh, C. diff, Clostridium difficile. And so what do we do? We give them antibiotics, because now they have a, a gut infection. But it was that antibiotics that sort of, if we think about the ecosystem as this, this lovely forest at the top of the figure, we're clear cutting the forest when we, when we give these patients antibiotics, and that's what allows this invasive species, C. diff, to, to grow up. So now we have a patient with C. diff, what do we do? We feed them antibiotics, we clear cut that forest again, and they come back with C. diff. So what do we do? We give them and more antibiotics. And once we do it three times, now they're classified as recurrent C. difficile patients, and now we can give them another treatment. And that treatment is uh, fecal transplant, so we take some of those healthy bacteria from healthy donors, uh, and it turns out, even for patients who have failed standard antibiotic therapy three or more times, often many, many more times, there's a 90% uh, recovery rate for uh, uh, re-inoculating them with healthy bacteria. So this is called fecal transplantation. Um, we were lucky enough to get involved with a study at the Broad Institute um, and at uh, MGH, and so we took 20 patients um, who had C. difficile. We had four donors. Those four donors contributed healthy bacteria to the 20 patients. About 90% of them recovered, uh, and this is what it looks like. So, so the different, um, each row here is, the first one is our patient before the fecal transplant. The second row is the donor, 
And the third row is the patient after fecal transplant. And, and the different columns and the different colors are, are, those are different bacteria, and the darker the color, the, the more bacteria that patient has. What I want you to do is look at this graph and, and figure out what is the rule? What's the algorithm that you could look at the patient before fecal transplant and, and look at the donor, and how would you figure out which bacteria are going to engraft? The reason this is important is because I said in the beginning, what we want to do is we want to take these bacteria from our freezer, we want to put them in a pill and feed them to patients. But if those bacteria don't engraft in those patients, if they don't become part of that patient's new ecosystem, then that drug's not going to work. And so we have to be able to understand which bacteria are going to engraft. OK. Um, we tried AND gates, we tried OR gates, we tried adding them. There, there were no simple answers, but then we turned it over to a machine learning algorithm, and this was the prediction we got. And we found out we could predict it about 86% of the time, and we're starting to learn the rules of which bacteria will actually engraft in a patient and which bacteria make good candidates as, as drugs. Um, so we're not just um, kind of limited to uh, the academic sphere. Um, in 2013, a, a really talented graduate student in my lab, uh, Mark Smith, uh, together with a, a Sloan School student, um, James Burgess, a postdoc in my lab, uh, Zane Kassam, um, and uh, Carolyn Edelstein, who's uh, outside uh, manning the uh, open biome booth, started a nonprofit to take these fecal transplants and disseminate them across the country to, to folks who need it. And I'm happy to say that uh, today uh, they've treated tens of thousands of patients for this disease. In fact, uh, the number of recurrent C. diff patients that now get treated by fecal transplants from uh, this MIT spinoff nonprofit uh, is greater than 50%. So greater than 50% of the folks with, uh, with this disease are now being treated by the, by the nonprofit. So uh, I think I'll... Uh, end there, and uh, I'll turn it over to Angie Belcher. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.